It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to another episode of Science on Top. This is episode 351, and today is Monday the 24th of February 2020. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hi Ed. Uh, remember, this show is only possible thanks to the generous donations of our Patreon supporters. Check out scienceontop.com slash donate to throw some coin at us each episode. And let's begin, Penny, with seahorses. Well known for taking the shape of their favourite chocolates, they are at risk. And I think 14 of the 50 or so species are officially listed as endangered or threatened. And that's led one team in Australia to come up with a a rather luxurious solution, hasn't it? It has. So, yeah, I didn't realise that the whole genus of seahorses is under threat, uh, hippocampus. These Australian ones, the White's seahorse or the Sydney seahorse, have been given a bit of a chance optimistically to help them bounce back while their natural habitats recover. Um, I hope they do but by seahorse hotels. So the idea from these hotels came from observations of what happens to like um, shipping containers and other bits and pieces that got dropped down and discarded, like so commercial fishing traps and so on. And over time, they become heavily covered in sponges and corals. So they actually became... Um, basically great homes, artificial homes for fish and other sort of marine invertebrates. And we've seen this kind of idea before with, um, you know, artificial reefs made of discarded tyres and things like that. So just providing that structure for marine life to live on. So the seahorses, the seahorse hotels are kind of special because of the way that they're made like kind of cages. The, um, the seahorse can hold on by curling their tail around the flat, the frame and the algae and sponges, and that helps, helps hold them in place and stops them getting swept away. And what they've found is they've been tracking and marking each seahorse with fluorescent tags, um, and they've found at least 64 different individuals using their hotels, the first 18 hotels over um, 2018. So... That's really great. It's really optimistic. So hopefully it seems to be helping them breed. It seems to be um, some seahorses have a strong attachment to the hotels. So they seem to be useful habitats. So I like this. It's a very um, nice way, whoops, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, <laughs> that we can support these beautiful animals. And it's something that is not too hard to do. No. It's you know, it's helping them have a habitat and it's something that's gotten some international interest as well. So hotels have been trialling around the world in Gibraltar, Greece, the US, the Philippines and Indonesia. So hopefully um, we can help seahorse populations recover just by sure. making the kind of habitat they want to be in. So it's only a matter of time, surely, until we get uh, seahorse hotel reviews and ratings. <laughs> seahorse Airbnb. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Air C and C. Yeah. Uh, but I got to give them credit though, just for the the media savvy of these researchers to call them oh, hotels because yeah. like, they're nothing like hotels. You know, there's no lobby. You don't have any. You don't have to pay for the rooms or anything like that. They're just literally. Habitat. They're sort of his room service though, because their food just floats on the <laughs> and does come to them. <laughs> That's true. That's true. But it's uh, you know another example of you want to get your research um, in the media and to get the word out. Give it a catchy name. Give it catchy phrases mm. that certainly I read it when I went. Oh, Seahorse Hotel. What's that? I love a bit of science article clickbait headline. 
What what's the main threat to seahorses? Is it like overfishing or something, or just habitat loss? Yeah, and dredging and trawling of the um the the floor of the bay. Okay. So all those sort of natural nooks and crannies that they would have been living in just get destroyed. Damn humans. Damn humans. All right. Well, from that cute and optimistic endeavour, let's move on to a somewhat more worrying story. One that you sent me, Lucas, which I think has a very misleading headline. (laughs) This is from Science Direct, and the headline reads, Methane emitted by humans vastly underestimated. Now, we need to be clear, they're not actually talking about human farts, are they? No, well... Not solely. A little bit. <laughs> no, 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 yeah. So, that it, it technically, yes, um, that is a part of it, but that's not the bit that's overestimated. So, you're quite right. It's not emitted by humans. It's emitted through human activity. That's, uh, you know, there was a little bit more to it. And this is, again, this is where... That, that whole role of the sub-editor, whose role is just to write the headlines. And I, I personally like to think that science writers often read the headlines that have been attributed to their stories and go, Ugh. <laughs> I reckon there's a lot of that going on. Yeah. So what is this about? Um, for quite some time, it has been... Um, it's been... Ex- I wouldn't say accepted, but it, but the... The uh, consensus has been that methane that's in the atmosphere, which is contributing to climate change, as methane is quite a potent greenhouse gas, for quite some time it's been the consensus that not much of this is coming from us because methane does have a lot of natural sources, Um natural sources which aren't related to and not affected by the, you know, human agriculture and and human, you know, um, influence on the environment. So, for example, you might say, well, cows, you know, there's often they talk about cow burps and cow farts being a part of what's contributing to methane. And, And for the purposes of this story, that would be considered something that is uh, um, human related because there, there simply wouldn't be anywhere near as many uh, of those you know particular animals if it weren't for our agriculture and, and using them for meat and milk and, and blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. So uh, for quite a while it's been considered that um, although methane is a significant uh, player in, in the greenhouse effect, what we're doing hasn't really had too much of an impact on that. That's been kind of an assumption, and there's a new study that's been published by some researchers at the University of Rochester who have gone back to ice cores to look at the specific period of time before and up to the the, um, the 1800s to, to get a snapshot of how much impact have we actually had. So a thing about methane is there are signatures that we can use to figure out whether methane has come from um, natural emissions, things like the melting of, of uh, permafrost, for example. Permafrost is a, is a, a prime example of, of where methane could be coming from. Uh, hydrocarbon deposits, uh, you know, releasing their, their methane into the atmosphere. Uh, or indeed um, animals and other other plants and so forth, because there's a lot of sources of methane that are quite natural, versus methane that is released into the atmosphere through mining and fossil fuels. And we can actually tell the difference between those two because of carbon-14. So carbon-14, which is a radioactive isotope, is present in methane, but it actually has a relatively short Um, half-life. So for um, fossil-derived methane, we don't see carbon-14 in it because it has been sequestered in the ground for a very long period of time. Mm -hmm. It spent hundreds of thousands or potentially even millions of years underground. So by the time we we let it out by burning whatever it is, whatever fuel it is that contains the methane, the Carbon-14 has completely um, decayed 
So it's not present when we look at it in the atmosphere. Whereas uh, newly created or released methane from uh, natural sources other than um, you know, fossil fuels do have this carbon-14 intact. So we had an idea looking at the current atmosphere of the percentages of methane that has carbon-14 versus methane that doesn't. Yep. But what we were not particularly clear on was what's the baseline? What was it before we started releasing this methane into the atmosphere through fossil fuels? So this team went back and looked at the at ice cores and ice cores uh, that they sourced from Greenland, which, which you know, as, as we've discussed before on the show, ice cores typically contain tiny air bubbles, which are basically trapped air from that period of time. So when they looked at those, um, they, they measured, as I, as I uh, said earlier, from basically composition of air from the early 18th century, which is really before the start of the mainstream industrial revolution, to the present day, because we didn't really begin using fossil fuels in significant amounts until the mid-19th century, more or less, you know, it's when all the coal really took off and so forth. So measuring those emission levels before this time period allowed them to identify what the baseline of natural emissions were absent the emissions from the fossil fuels that are that are in the atmosphere today. And what they found was that the accepted levels of impact from fossil fuels, well, let me put it this way, I'll read directly from this. By measuring the carbon-14 isotopes in the air from more than 200 years ago, the researchers found that almost all of the methane emitted to the atmosphere was biological in nature until about 1870. That is when the fossil fuel component began to rise rapidly. The timing coincides with a sharp increase in the use of fossil fuels. So they found that the levels of naturally released methane are about 10 times lower than the previous re uh, research reported. Now, this is actually indirectly good news. Oh. It's good news because fossil fuel... So methane, as I mentioned, has, is a very potent greenhouse gas, but it actually... It doesn't hang around for very long in the atmosphere. So because it doesn't hang around long in the atmosphere, unlike carbon dioxide, which does hang around for a very long time in the atmosphere and will, as, as a result, we'll be dealing with the impact of carbon dioxide that we're releasing right now for a very, very long time, methane doesn't last long at all. So if we do take measures to reduce our methane, um, our, our um, fossil fuel-derived methane from being emitted, mm. then the return on that change in behaviour will be much more rapid than the return will be from reducing CO2 emissions, i.e. we'll actually start to see a benefit faster, sure. especially considering the amount of it that's in the atmosphere is now a significant portion of, of what's affecting climate change. Mm. So this is a good thing. Um, yeah. And as, as the lead researcher actually said, he said, I don't want to get too hopeless on this because my data does have positive implications. Most of the methane emissions are actually anthropogenic. So we've got more control. We have it now in our control to do something about this, which is, which is actually good news. Absolutely. Yeah. The, it, Assuming we do something about it. And that's always been the thing. You know, we've for a long time, we've had the means to uh, reverse or deal with climate change. We just haven't had the political will a lot of the time, and hopefully that's changing. Right. But this particular study, I mean, we've studied ice cores for 20, 30, 40 years. It surprises me that this hasn't been done yet. It surprised me as well, and I think the key here was actually looking at not just the carbon-14 as a way of, of differentiating between the, the sources of methane, but specifically looking at for that period of time in the ice core because they could see in the they could see how much methane there was in the past, mm. but the time frames that they were looking at didn't really give us that baseline because as you know the Earth's been through so many different cycles over such a long period of time. It's you know so so I think the the real difference here is looking at that specific time frame. Let's just go back to this very short period of time, this two hundred odd year um, period. To, to get a, a, an indication of how much of this is actually because of us. Right. And it, basically, it looks like all of it is. Yeah. All, all of that, you know, um, uh, you know fossil fuel-derived 
uh, methane is is actually all us, and that's a big chunk of what's in the atmosphere right now. Yeah, so it's that sort of zooming in rather than say, well, twenty thousand years ago this was the methane level, but actually looking at those specific years, eighteen seventy, before that, after that, mm. and comparing it, yeah, yeah, and and we know that prior to that. Pretty much all of the methane in the air was was that natural type of methane that's just biological in nature. Let's hope mm. that that is yet more good news that is acted upon. <laughs> that's the key, isn't it? Yeah, always. All right, Penny. It's a constant source of fascination for us here just how much we can learn about the behaviours of people from prehistory. And there are obvious clues like cave art and stone tools, for example, but there's also some surprising and subtle pieces of evidence. So what have we recently gleamed about the earliest Aboriginal Australians and what they were eating? Yeah, this is a really interesting one, um, not just because of the age of the find, which would be interesting on its own, but from what it tells us about one of those really, really ancient migrations of people from Asia down into Australia. So the find itself, which was published in Nature Communications, is essentially an archaeological site of um, Majedbi, Majedbebi, which is a sandstone rock shelter on Mira country in Arnhem Land. And it describes different layers of charred plant remains. And what they found by looking at the remains is that there's fruit pips, nutshells, peelings, there's fibrous, part, fibrous bits of tubers, there's fragments of palm stems. stems. So all the leftover bits of meals that were cooked and shared at the rock shelter 65,000 years ago. What's really interesting is that some of them were really, really difficult and labour intensive and may have taken up to days to process. That was slow so cooked. Some of them, like, they were slow cooked. It was slow food. Um, so some of them were things like fruit, of course, which you can just basically eat. But some, like yams, they had to be cooked, they had to be leached, they had to be pounded. Some of them, because um, the archaeologists work with um, Aboriginal traditional owners and research colleagues to go and identify modern day foods that are eaten, some of them they could only get open with a like an electric chainsaw. Oh, wow. Um, whereas traditionally that would have been pounded with a mortar and pestle type thing. So that's to get pandanus kernels and so on. So what this tells us is some of the very first people that we've got evidence for in that region, and I say that we've got evidence for because if you remember there was a site that was described last year which had vague mm -hmm. suggestions that there was people down in Warrnambool 100,000 years ago. So we're really limited by evidence at the moment. It's all like everything to do with human migration. It's intensely interested in studying that there's so little actual stuff I like the way you said, though, there's not much evidence at the moment. It's that optimistic thing, like, you know, counterintuitively, you'd think as time goes by, the evidence would dwindle. But of course, our technology and our resources yeah. are improving. So there is a good chance we may find more evidence in the future. And what it says, too, it's quite interesting because there used to be a theory that people who migrated through from, you know, Africa and the Middle East through Southeast Asia um, were just doing it really quickly doing it with re in a really low effort way. So they weren't really integrating with their environment. They were kind of moving along the coast. They were eating shellfish, other things that were easy to catch. But what this says is that the very, or these early people in Australia were already quite skilled at foraging. They knew a whole lot of techniques to eat a really diverse range of plant foods. They weren't just kind of going, oh, let's just stick to the beaches and eat pippies. But using foods which were really time consuming and really labor intensive to eat so it it tells a bit of a different story about how that migration might have happened and what what life would have been like for people in those migrating kind of groups that were doing this huge mass migrate well not mass but huge distance covered from the birthplace of human evolution in africa and the middle east but also I think it's interesting that they had obviously harnessed fire. Now, whether or not they were actually mm. uh, generating the fire themselves or it was from bushfire and smouldering embers left over or something yeah. like that. But the fact that they're using fire 65,000 years ago is really impressive. They're using fire, cooking it, 
and using all these different kinds of foods as well and processing them. So quite a lot of effort involved, I guess, in just daily nutrition. And fascinating that we can work that out 65,000 years later. That's awesome. It's amazing. Yeah. All the, you know, just from the charred remains of a campfire. <laughs> Have you guys read uh, Dark Emu at all? No. Yes, love it. It's supposed to be very good. Really, really good. You can read Young Dark Emu, which is a lot shorter. But <laughs> Trust me, I'm a teacher. That's the Cliff Notes version. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, obviously totally different region, but amazing um, recounting of the large-scale agriculture that the Australian Aborigines were mm. partaking in, much to the uh, uh, deletion as far as history is concerned. So, yeah, definitely a good read. Cool. All right. Well, Penny... I learned a new word this week. Obviously, the word healthcare has been widely used over the last few years, but I'd never heard of the word death care before. So what should we be thinking about when it comes to our end of life and our remains? Uh, we, is burial the answer or are there other more environmentally friendly options we should maybe look to? No, yeah, I had always assumed that cremation was kind of a good option because Burial is very traditional in a lot of societies, but it also becomes quite problematic. Like cemeteries get full mm -hmm. and then a couple of hundred years later, no one remembers those people and there's nowhere for currently living people to be buried and they take up a lot of room. And there's, if, you drive, if you live in Melbourne driving around, there's just a few weird little cemeteries just yeah. there, you know, here and there plotted around. So I thought, oh, cremation. But cremation is actually quite um, environmentally not great. It produces a lot of carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases. Um, it's not the biggest environmental impact that we'd have in our lives. It's maybe equivalent to a flight from London to Rome. But it's also not... That still sounds pretty huge. It's still because flying is one of the... Yeah. Um, along with eating meat and so on, is one of the big things we can make. Like I think I've read you can, you know, turn off your lights at night and take your appliances off standby all you like, but you take one flight mm. and a lot of that effort has been discounted basically. Yeah. So cremation produces a lot of CO2, um, but composting is a more environmentally friendly alternative and it's fast composting. So, I mean, as we were just discussing about archaeological sites, you can bury someone and then find them 65,000 years later. So in a way, you might think, oh, just burying someone naturally is, help, is a good way to go. And there are places, I know at least in the UK, where you can do that. There's like secluded woodland areas where you can get buried in a, um, a biodegradable shroud. So you'll naturally be recycled back into the ecosystem. But this fast composting process um, basically will turn your corpse into two wheelbarrows worth of soil in four to six weeks. And the soil has quite a low um, coliform bacterial count, which means that you can actually scatter it on your garden like it's safe to use. So what happens is the body gets placed in a steel container with wood chips, alfalfa and straw. Um, the humidity and atmosphere are controlled. And what this does is it creates conditions for thermophilic microbes or heat-loving microbes. So instead of decomposing normally, it decomposes at an accelerated rate because of these specialised bacteria. So that's really, really interesting. So if there's enough feedstock, feedstock so if there's enough of you left over, um, you can get these weird thermophilic bacteria. And I reckon if Shane had been on tonight he would have gone nuts about <laughs> all these different things. So everything gets decomposed, including bones and teeth. Um, so obviously if you've got pacemakers or artificial hips, they need to be taken out beforehand. So it means what this means is that after you die, you could become composted, your relatives could pop you in the garden and plant a tree or a rose bush in memory, which I think is a really beautiful way. The other thing I found really interesting about this article is that there's another kind of cremation called water cremation, which apparently is chosen because it families feel, this is a quote from the article, 
it's a more gentle process than burning. It's seen as gentler. Now, this basically involves putting the body in a pressurized tank of water mixed with potassium hydroxide, an incredibly strong base, and heating it up to 150 degrees. And then you end up with just the bones. That doesn't sound very you gentle. Feel, that doesn't sound <laughs> gentle. Like I was like, is this a real non sequitur? Do people just hear, hear water cremation yeah. and not think? Or do people but not we- know what potassium hydroxide is? Yeah, wouldn't wouldn't that effectively release the chemicals into the atmosphere anyway? If they're I being dissolved? No, I'm not sure what happens afterwards. I mean they've got to go somewhere. Um I mean <laughs> Yeah, well it would. It- maybe it produces less greenhouse gases. Yeah. Maybe they're the better gases to be releasing or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think of all these things. For my death care, I probably would prefer to be composted if possible. Yeah, especially when you consider... Listeners, you can... um, (laughs) Write that down. that to my family. (laughs) Write that down. But no, given that it's it's basically it's returning all that Mm. carbon from your body back Mm. into the earth and and growing things rather than, yeah, Yeah. releasing it into the atmosphere or or leaching chemicals into the groundwater. Or turning it into action, boxing it up and... No, I think that, yeah. that's awesome. Although there is something nice, though, about the thought that some archaeologist in, you know, 100,000 years yeah, might, true. <laughs> might dig you up, but it's pretty unlikely. Yeah, well, I don't know. Cremation, they might find these charred bones and start going, oh, look, they cooked and ate their <laughs> relatives or something. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh... And it does remind me of my honours thesis, which was on an archaeological site in Turkey called Çatal Hürk. And one of the things that they did there was they would display the skulls of deceased ancestors. Mm-hmm. Now, that sounds incredibly morbid and incredibly goth to us these days. It's not something we do. Mm. But there's no photographic art. Yeah. Portraiture wasn't really a thing in their representational art. But I can see how maybe having your grandma's skull up on the shelf, yeah. a special niche in the wall, would actually be quite comforting in a way if that was normalised yeah. in your culture. I can get that. So I guess death's a weird thing. Very much so, absolutely. Wouldn't there be a market for turning them into like bricks or something so that you could build, you could have them in your in your house? Like let's go up to the second floor and, and look at Grandpa. You know, he's that brick well, or something like wasn't that. Wasn't there a company that would turn your cremated pet into a little diamond? Pro, that I sounds think there right was. actually, yeah. I think there was. That surely uses a lot of energy, though. Surely. <laughs> yeah. um, that's, that's interesting. And it's also one of those discussions that I think we don't have often enough about what is it that, A, that we want to have happen after we die, and, B, what's the environmental impact of that? Because... Mm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, huge ramifications, obviously. And I don't know the answer. I think this will this will change over time. I mean, on one hand, I like the soil idea and mm-hmm. all lots of stuff because, mm. like, yeah, because then you 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 literally become a part of the cycle of life, and that's pretty cool. Yep. But I don't think I really like the idea of them putting that soil like on the veggie patch or something. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, uh, oh, what's for dinner? Are we having uh, we're having the freshly grown vegetables that 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 are, contain grandma? I'm not sure. I'm not sure that's ideal. I don't know. Well, maybe like a, a tree or something, a, a remembrance tree for you or a shrubbery or something maybe. I could get behind shrubbery? that. <laughs> shrubbery? I was a noble. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, good to have that conversation and talk about it with your loved ones and uh, keep the, the planet in mind when you do. And on that happy thought, that's our <laughs> show. <laughs> As always, all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 351. And if you go to scienceontop.com slash donate, you can sign up on Patreon and help us pay the bills. Thank you, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. I rate the chance of a nuclear war in my lifetime as being fairly low. Uh, I rate the chance of a widespread epidemic far worse than Ebola in my lifetime as well over 50%. 
There's two kinds of flus. There's flus that spread between humans very effectively, and there's flus that kill lots of people. And those two properties have only been combined uh, into a, a widespread flu once in history. Well, that is Spanish flu. We have no idea where it came from. It's called the Spanish flu because the Spanish press was the freest. They were the first to talk openly about it. And so in the annals of epidemic history, that's the big event. And the Ebola epidemic showed me that we're not ready for a serious epidemic, an epidemic that would be more infectious and would spread faster than Ebola did. This is the greatest risk of a huge tragedy. This is the most likely thing by far to kill over 10 million excess people in a year. We don't need to invest nearly what we do in military preparedness. This is something where less than a billion a year on R&D, medical surveillance, uh, standby personnel, cross-training the military so they can play a role in terms of all the logistics here. This can be done, and we may not get many more warnings like this one to, to say, okay, it's a pretty modest investment to avoid something that really, in terms of the, the human condition, would be a, a gigantic setback.